So I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Diane. Uh, Dr. Diane Burnett comes to us from Arizona. She was born and raised in Arizona. And as a young person, she discovered the Seventh-day Adventist Church at the age of 14. After a few years on a different path, she came back to the church, primarily drawn by its incredible health message. She began implementing the strategies endorsed by the spirit of prophecy, among them hydrotherapy, massage, and diet out of her own home, and people were drawn to her caring heart. In the 1980s, natural remedies were coming under fire by the medical establishment, and after meeting Dr. Charles Thomas, <clears throat> was encouraged to move on from her training in dental as a dental assistant to pursue a degree in medicine from the University of Arizona. Upon completing her residency, she immediately began practicing natural therapies. From 2008 to 2010, she worked at Uchi Pines and was privileged to be mentored and gain the friendship of Calvin Thrash, MD, and the husband of Agatha Thrash, MD. After leaving Uchi Pines, Diane continued practicing natural medicine based on the spirit of prophecy and often consulted with Dr. Thrash. In retrospect, while appreciating the medical training she received in medical school, she found the principles and philosophies taught there incongruent with the spirit of prophecy and the challenging paradigm to overcome. By God's grace and guidance, she has persevered in teaching, speaking, and practicing medicine based on scripture and the spirit of prophecy. After a three year break where she focused on parental caregiving, Diana is now able to continue her teaching and speaking as she also works to open a lifestyle and treatment center in Arizona. Today, uh, Diane will be presenting part one of a three-part series entitled Throne Room Under Siege. Today is part one, the physiology of sin. The understanding of the physiology of the body and mind as the temple of God is the foundation to understanding the association of health and salvation. Satan understands this physiology and utilizes it to undermine our will and lead us into sin. It is God's design for us to understand Satan's methods and through his power to gain the victory over sin. This study is the first of a three-part series called Throne Room Under Siege. It explores the connection between the sanctuary pattern and the design of the human temple, shedding light on the work of the atonement and health laws. Welcome, Dr. Diane. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be back with you. I've I've been able to share a few times on Med Missionary, and I just pray that God will bless us richly today. And so um, it's a little after four o'clock, and I'll probably be going maybe an hour to an hour and 15 minutes, and we'll take a little break to answer questions. And if we still have time, I'll continue on. I could fill the full two hours, but we want to give you a chance to ask questions. So with that said, I'm going to share my screen. Oops. Here we go. Okay. Can everybody see that okay? All right. Yes. All right. Let me just offer a short word of prayer also. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege to be living in this time of history. And we look for the soon and powerful coming of our Savior Jesus. Father, help us in every moment of our life to be growing into that character that you want to fit us with, that we might be fitted for heaven. So bless our time together, Father. May your Holy Spirit be with us, with each one of us, and may we hear words, each one of us, that um, will edify us and help us in our individual walk. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I'm from Arizona, the Grand Canyon State, and I don't I know it's hard on chat to really um, have interaction, but you know, the Grand Canyon, we have visitors, millions of visitors every year that come to see this incredible canyon. It's a mile deep 
at its um, deepest part. And one day um, I was sitting on the edge of the canyon. And as I looked over this view of this incredible canyon, you know, in one way it really looks desolate, but when you sit there, it's breathtaking, it's awe-inspiring. But I had this realization that this canyon is a result of sin. So when God came down upon this earth and saw that the wickedness of this earth was exceeding great, and he repented because he had created this earth, and he told the world that he was going to destroy it with a flood. And this is the result of it. And so when I looked at this canyon and I think how really majestic it is, on the other hand, it's like, this is, the sin is not majestic. It's deep, it's scarring, just like this flood scarred the earth, sin scars us. and the only healing for the depth of sin is the blood of our savior. And so as I get into today's lecture, I, want, I just want to set this stage that we need to understand the depth of sin and the magnitude of salvation, of what it cost heaven and the power that Jesus purchased for us to be overcomers. And so as we go through this, um, the physiology of sin, it's not that there's an excuse for sin, but you will see that what I am going to go through, it's basically neurology 101. It's a basic physiology of how the brain works, how the mind works, and what happens when we make choices. So we will just progress through. Um, there's this quote in Great Controversy telling us the time that we live in and what we need to be doing. It says, we are living. When are we living? We are living in the most solemn period of world's history. Just that right there should cause us to stop and think about it. You know, as I'm thinking of this statement, the most solemn period of this world's history, how many people are out having a, a party? You know, they go to comedian shows, they go for entertainment, just to lift their spirits, take their minds off of the trouble of this world. But yet we need to have sober thoughts. We need to be preparing for the, what is coming on the earth. And we're told that the destiny, why it's so solemn, is because the destiny of earth's teeming multitudes is about to be decided. Our own future, well, our own future well-being and also the salvation of other souls depend upon the course which we now pursue. And so it's not just that our own destiny depends on what we do, but those that are around us, their destiny depends on the course we take. So here's what we need. We need to be one guided by the spirit of truth. More so than ever, we need the Holy Spirit to teach us what is true and to avoid deception. Number two, every follower of Christ should earnestly inquire, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? We each have a job, and if we ask God, what are we to do? He will direct us. Next, we need to humble ourselves before the Lord with fasting and prayer, to meditate much upon his word, especially upon the scenes of the judgment. We should now seek a deep and living experience in the things of God, 
We have not a moment to lose. Events of vital importance are taking place around us. We are on Satan's enchanted ground. Sleep not, sentinels of God. The foe is lurking near, ready at any moment should you become lax and drowsy to spring upon you and make you his prey. So not a moment to lose. We're on Satan's enchanted ground. Adam and Eve wandered into Satan's enchanted ground. And ever since, this world has been Satan's enchanted ground. So as Brother Andrew had mentioned, this talk, The Physiology of Sin, um, is part of a, the three-part um, program that I do called The Throne Room Under Siege. And so this first part, The Physiology of Sin, is um, talking about the king of the mind. And um, when we understand the physiology of the body, and that I want to include the psychology of the mind, so physiology of the body and the brain, in per particularly in context of being the temple of God, it is the uh, effectual and essential preparation of the body for the reception of the Holy Spirit. So in this first part, we are going to see how putting human desires over God's law is the basis of all sin. And the result of sin is the loss of the Holy Spirit, the loss of our power to obey. Um, not, we won't get into this today, but maybe sometime in the future, I'll be able to share part two and part three. Part two is the physiology of victory. So we don't want to just talk about the physiology of sin, but understanding the physiology of sin, we are able to understand the physiology of victory. And that is looking at the work of the Holy Spirit to bring back the strength that we need for the will, the deci decisive um, power of the brain and of the body in the frontal lobe to be able to obey God's law and not to um, follow human desires in the limbic system. And part three is looking at physiology and the part that it plays in preparing for the latter reign. So physiology, the laws of health, and obedience all tie into the latter reign. So I want to read this promise that is given to the Church of Laodicean. So we know that in Revelation chapter two and three are the church are the messages to the seven churches, and every church that is mentioned there, they have um, a rebuke. Of course, except for two of the churches, did not have a rebuke, but every one of them will have a promise. And this one to the Laodicean church, which is our time period is to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. And so when we finish this talk, you will understand more clearly this promise that Jesus was giving to his people when he said, in my throne, not on my throne, but in my throne. So just keep that scripture in mind as we go through this so that we can go back and say, okay, what was Jesus really promising to those that overcome? And so as we get started, I want to just ask a basic question. Who sits on a throne? So we could say a king, of course, a, a king has his throne, and that was his seat of authority. So what particularly is a king? I just want to go through some of the definitions and the roles of a king. First of all, they're a ruler. And a person who's a ruler, they have authority over a lower power, lower people, over citizens, over other things. So they have power and they have control. They make decisions, they make rules, they make laws that govern 
their community. They might not be good laws, but the king gets to make them. He gives the orders, but not only can he make laws and give orders, but in order to have any power, that king has to be able to enforce obedience. So in one way or another, there has to be some power that is behind the, uh, the authority of the king that will back up what he says. And typically that's going to be an army. Um, they're called the Lord or a master is another rule for them. And they are supreme. They're a monarch. So I want to um, bring your minds to a, yeah, this isn't just a childhood game, but I don't know if any of you have ever played the game King of the Mountain. This was a pretty popular game. It's outlawed in many places now because it can get rather um, violent and hurtful. But if you'll remember um, in the game, I think of my family, we used to play it all the time or a group of kids. You just have a place that is, um, has a high place. So whether it's a hill or whether it's um, on top of a mound of snow, um, that is the top of the mountain. And the, and the goal is, is who, to be on top of that mountain. So whoever is the one who gets to stand on top of the mountain, they are king. But anybody can become the king if they can get the other person off of the mountain. And then they would be said to have seized the throne. So when you think of this game, I want to ask the question. What are ways that you would get the king off of the mountain? So the first thing is by just brute force. You know, so if you have um, somebody that's three foot high and somebody that's four foot high and maybe have a few years on top of them, they're going to have more strength. And they're just by brute force and strength, they're going to be able to pull or push, you know, and wrestle the, the person off and take over the mountain. But it's not just by force that a mountain can be won. So just like in any type of contest, you can use strategy, you use intelligence. And in strategy, you can use distraction. You can use, people use cheating. They use deception. There's foul play. There's circumstances, like if the person gets hurt, you know, while they're kind of tumbling about, they can twist an ankle and there goes their strength. And so someone else can easily then take them over. The problem with this game is that it pushes for domination. People, this is in general with sports, with games, there's this drive to win. And in winning, it's this um, sense of domination. And this is exactly parallel to war. In fact, this game, King of the Mountain, was parallel to war games and sports. Sports were pat patterned after war. And so we say it's play, but it's not really played. There's as much stakes at time behind some of our sports as there is potentially with war. And the problem with that comes because in winning, um, it creates a pride of self. And not only do, does a person turn their focus on themselves, but they will glory over someone else's loss and humiliation. And as I was thinking of this game and I think about the contest, the great controversy, we can see that that's exactly what happened to Lucifer as he um, went on this pathway to become the, the dragon and the great deceiver, um, pride of self. And now Satan's glory is was one to have loss against the heavenly trio 
over God. And then when Christ was on this earth, it was a matter of his glory of the suffering that Jesus had to go through. I think of the movie, The Passion, and there's clips in there that really behind that movie, it was glorying in the humiliation that Christ went through for our sin, for our sins. So King the Mountain, the main thing that I want to bring out in this is that um, there's a place of highest position and they're striving for that position. There's a quote in Child Guidance. It says, without freedom of choice, Adam's obedience would not have been voluntary, but forced. There could have been no development of character. It would have been unworthy of man as an intelligent being and would have sustained Satan's charge of God's arbitrary rule. So this game, King of the Mountain, is really a carnal game. It's not the way God plays. God is truly the king of the whole universe, but he doesn't play by force. And this is just um, what God did in creating all of the other worlds, the inhabited worlds, but in his greatest gift to mankind, Adam and Eve, he gave them freedom of choice. And so God's way is a way of love. And the contest really with Satan results in war. So that I don't, I don't want to leave the idea that that's the way God plays. That's not at all his character. So as we're, we're thinking of this king idea, I'm, I'm going to be moving toward a principle. And then we're going to look at how the brain operates, but it follows this pattern. So if you'll remember in um, the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 8, up to this, this point of time, the children of Israel were ruled, well, first they were ruled by God. God was their king in the wilderness. And then as they moved through a little bit of time and they settled in the promised land, um, God set up judges. And Samuel was one of those judges at the time that the people, the children of Israel, looked around at other nations and they wanted to be like the other nations. And so when they came to Samuel and pressed him to have a king, Samuel was greatly distressed. And when he went to God and talked to him about it, God said to him, you know, Samuel, give them what they want. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me as their rule, ruler. But before you give them a king, just give them the warning. This is what's going to happen if you set a man in the position of the higher power, if you set a man to be your ruler. So God told them, if you have a king, um, a human king, here's what they're going to do. They're going to take all your land. It's going to belong to them. They're going to take your sons and they're going to put them in their army. They're going to take your daughters and they're going to be their maids and they'll be their, their bakers, their, their workers. So everything that you have is going to belong to the king. Essentially, you are going to become a slave. So Samuel went to the people and he told them just what God said. Yet to their view, looking at the glory that kings had, and it just seemed so impressive. They said, we want it. We want a king. And so, as you know from history, God gave the children of Israel a king. So at this point, I want to just put out this basics. This is the order of authority that God has set up throughout all of the universe, throughout all of creation. So God is the higher power, and all of his creation is the lower power. 
when he made this earth, it's essentially man and all of created beings are the lower power. And so when the children of Israel wanted a king, what they were essentially saying is that they wanted a man to be in the position of higher power. And that goes directly against the authority of heaven. So at creation, we just expand this thought a little bit more. So we have God, he's the higher power, and um, it's just a matter of semantics. He's the highest power. I'm not saying there's anything over him, but we have the higher power and we have lower power. So basically high power over low power. And man then was given authority over the rest of creation. As we see in Genesis 128, God said, replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. And again, Paul in the New Testament, he repeats that saying that God had put all things in subjection under Adam's feet. So you see this, God is the king, the highest power, and then under him was man in subjection to God. And under man, God said, you have dominion and you care for this earth. So now we're getting into the physiology of sin. As we've established this order, the higher power over the lower power. When we look at what happened in heaven, the very inception of sin. In Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, we read, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. And essentially what Satan was saying, or Lucifer at the time, he was saying, I want to be God. I want to sit in his place, not just be like him. You know, I want to be like Jesus. I want his character. But that's not what Lucifer was insinuating. Lucifer was jealous when he found out that Jesus had this position of God. And Lucifer thought that that should belong to him. So here's, here's Satan's plan for authority. Instead of God being the higher power, Lucifer says, I will ex exalt myself above the throne of God. I will be the higher power. I will be the king. And then under him would be God and all of created beings. So Satan isn't just happy with being the, the ruler over other angels, which are also created. But then when this earth was created, he wanted to be God of this world. So what happens when there's this contention? It's not, it wasn't that it was God's plan. This is just what happens when this spirit of a lower power seeking to be in the position of a higher power. And we read this in Revelation 12. There was war in heaven and Satan was cast out and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this battle that began in heaven, king of the mountain was brought down here to this earth and has continued all through 6,000 years. So as we are facing this battle, the mountain that is under contention is the control center of the human being. It is our brains, it is our mind that is the battlefield. That is what Satan wants to control by force. Now, God also wants to have us under his dominion, not for the um, mere dominion, but because of his love, because he created us and because he knows what's for our best. So I have this quote here from um, Spiritual Gifts, volume two, page 277. 
I have been shown that Satan has not been stupid and careless these many years, these almost 6,000 years when she wrote this, since his fall, but he has been learning. He has grown more artful. His plans are laid deeper and are more covered with a religious garment to hide their deformity. The power of Satan to now tempt and deceive is tenfold greater than it was in the days of the apostle. His power has increased and it will increase until it is taken away. His wrath and hate grow stronger as his time to work draws near its close. So here we are over a hundred years from the time that this was penned. And I'm 65 right now. And I can tell you, I can think back to when I was a teenager, when I was in my 20s, when I'm in my 30s, just in what we have gone through in the last 50 years and seeing the progress in the media, seeing the progress in technology to the very crisis that we're in right now, we can see why his power to tempt is 10 times greater. Not only has this work in every area of our life made us weaker, but the channels to control our mind have been um, even greater. So here's a couple more passages that cause us to, to pay attention to what Satan is up to and why we need to pay attention. We're told in letter 66, 1894, satanic agencies in disguise are on the track of every one of you listening, on the track of every true worker for the master. So we are never safe for a moment. Satanic agencies do not look satanic. They are in disguise and they're after each one of us. And then we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, we are not ignorant of his devices. Do we want to focus on Satan? No, it's not that we want to focus on, on him, but we do not want to be ignorant of the way he works. You know, the most successful business people are they they follow a um, an educational process called neuroeconomics in neuroeconomics they want to make money and so they want to know how to get you to spend your money on their product and so in order to do that they study the work of the brain so it's called neuroeconomics if you ever want to learn about the brain, that's the type of article you want to study. They have it mastered because they want to know how to control you in order to get your money. So as we follow down this chain of thought, as we are looking at Satan's devices, here is a key to how he works in a thousand different ways. We are told that Satan exercised his power of hypnotism over Adam and Eve. So this is one of the things that makes it hard when we're talking on Zoom because I can't really see your faces and I, I, it's hard to um, interact with you. But do you understand what is going on in the brain with hypnotism? When you read this sentence, Satan exercised his power of hypnotism over Adam and Eve. Do you understand how he did that? When you read chapter three of Genesis, do you see the steps, step by step, how Satan brought Eve into hypnotism? So, I'm, this is the basics that we're going to go through today. So as we move into this, I want to 
just look at a few different facts about this incredible three pound brain that's on top of our shoulders. Even though it's only three pounds, it is the most complex object in the universe. Our brain consists of about 86 plus or minus billion neurons, about as many stars as in, are in the Milky Way. Every cell that's in our brain has a function, every neuron. You've heard that we just use 10% of our brain. This is not true. We, we use every cell and every part of our brain is interconnected and working. There are anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 synapses for each neuron. So if you took the 100,000 miles of blood vessels, you could circle the earth five times. That's how much blood flow is required going through our brain. And the activity of our brain would generate 10 to 23 watts of power or enough to power a small um, watt light bulb. And one of these things as strong and as incredible as our brain is, it's very easily damaged by chemicals and toxins. And our brain has what's called a blood brain barrier. It's a special lining of blood of cells that are like a net to keep toxins out from getting into the main part of our, our neural network and prevent them from being damaged. But in many of the substances that Satan has created, it breaks down this blood brain barrier and these toxins have free access right up into the brain. And I'll just mention as an aside at this point, talking about that, that's one of the um, damaging parts of the COVID virus. The spike protein is designed to be able to break through the blood brain barrier. And so one of the major side effects from a COVID, um, whether it's the actual illness or from the vaccine where your body is generating the spike protein, it is brain damage. So it's just like having infarcts in your brain from the spike protein and inflammation. Okay, so let's go kind of on a fast overview on the different parts of the brain and their functions. So in the very front of the brain, it's your largest lobe, it's called the frontal lobe. And that's um, responsible for your thinking and for making decisions. And then you have um, three other sensory lobes. You have the parietal lobe um, right here, that's right behind the frontal lobe. And then down to the very back is your occipital lobe, which is responsible for vision. Oh, the parietal lobe is perception and the integration of all five of your senses. And then right through here, where we call this our temple. So this is the temporal lobe through here. And it is responsible for um, giving your brain the signals that come from your smell, from taste, from sound. So um, the major part of your senses. It's also the part where you process um, what you're seeing, your stimuli. So it helps you to recognize faces and when you're traveling through a place and you say, I've been here before, it's that part of your brain recognizing the scenery that's around you. And the temporal lobe is also responsible for perception along with the parietal lobe. And another big part is that plays a part in language and your role, there's a role in emotion and memory. And then down at the very bottom under the occipital lobe, you have the cerebellum. That's responsible for keeping you balanced and for helping you to have movement and sense, um, sense of where you're at while you're moving. You know, you might have been to the doctor and he does a cerebellum test. He has you close your eyes, you're standing and you put your hands straight out 
and he has you, you know, like your hands are out and he has you close your eyes and it's to see if you can keep your hands in place. That's a function of the cerebellum. And then coming out of the brain, going down into the spinal cord is your brain stem. That's responsible for your attention, your alertness, and information that comes from your body up into the brain and from the brain down to the body. So that's the main parts of the body. But um, the biggest part that I want to focus on is the frontal lobe. It is the most important part of your brain. And even in science today, they call the frontal lobe the higher power. So we were talking about high powers. Well, we're mentioning it here. This is the way God created us. And the high power, the higher powers of this temple, this body that God has made us, is the frontal lobe. So if we talk about having a higher power, obviously there must be a lower power. And so we're going to look at the limbic system. So down deep, um, under the frontal lobe, temporal, parietal, deep in the center of the brain, we have what's called the limbic system. And the limbic system has multiple brain structures that are responsible for your emotions. So your emotional um, feelings, that type of thing are coming from the limbic system. It's also responsible for your motivation. It's when you wake up in the morning and you feel like getting up because you've got to get this done, you've got to get that done, or you have a vision. Some people, you know, they, they want to have a job and they want to make so much money or, you know, they're driven to go to school because if you get an education, you can get a better paying job or, you know, as a Christian, there's motivation for sharing the gospel when you see someone accept the message and, and you know that their names are written in heaven. So all of those type of things, all those varieties, what motivates us? This is coming from the limbic system. And most importantly in the limbic system is our biological drives. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in just a couple slides down when we talk about the hypothalamus. Another big part of the limbic system is in memory making. So we have the hippocampus, hippocampus. That's one of the systems that are broken down with dementia. The hippocampus is um, a big part of our memory making um, process. And somehow the memories get locked in and you can't um, reach them. But they also see um, that in your memories, if it's especially linked to something emotional or dramatic, it is more deeply impressed on your, on your brain, in your memory, and physical sensations along with that. So a very important thing, um, part of the brain that is connected to the limbic system over here, um, under the thalamus, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but this red dot is the area of the nucleus accumbens. And that has been nicknamed the pleasure center. So in order to understand that, we're going to, we're going to look at the scientists of um, when they were discovering the, the nucleus accumbens. But before we go on to this, as I mentioned, if we have a higher power, there's going to be a lower power. So the lower power of the brain is the limbic system. All right, so let's just look before we go on to some of the other aspects like the hypothalamus. I just want to give a quick overview of what the individual neuron looks like. So as I mentioned, they used to say that there were probably a hundred billion neurons. Well, you know, who really sat down and counted them? Um, it's kind of a funny thing what scientists are doing, but they're continuing to study the brain. And today's consensus is that there's about 86 
billion, plus or minus 2 billion, either way, um, neurons. And each one is can be a little bit different, but they all have a similar design. So you have the nerve cell or nerve body, and within it, you, just like every other cell, there's a nucleus where the DNA is, and you see these, um, they look like antlers coming off. These are called dendrites. And on the dendrites is what is the connection to another neuron. So coming off of the main body of the neuron, you see this long cable that it kind of looks like hot dog buns around it. That's called the myelin sheath. It's the insulating factor. The, the neurons are an electrical system. And just like how we have um, a coating over electrical wires to protect it, to insulate it, that's what the myelin sheath does. Um, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune process where the body attacks the myelin sheath and erodes this protection, this insulation off, and you get short circuiting in the transmission of the electrical current. So you follow the axon down and you can see another, they look like antlers again, but this, these are terminal parts of the axon. And at the very end of them, there is what is called boutons. The French scientist that first saw these, he called them buttons. Oh, they look like boutons. And so that's how they got their name as boutons. And they connect to the dendrites of another nerve body, but there is not direct contact. There's a gap there. So that's the synaptic junction. And at that junction, you see this picture over um, to the left, and it's the two different um, boutons, and you see these little dots in the middle. Those are neurotransmitters. So we need to talk a little bit about neurotransmitters. Um, the main thing you want to know about them, they are chemical messengers. So when you think of messenger, that's communication. And you know, if you have bad communication, if you have, um, you tell somebody something and they don't quite get the wording right, you can end up with a whole different story. And it, it kind of reminds me of the game, you know, that you would have a, like 20 people in a circle and each person would whisper this certain sentence to the one next to them. And then by the time it got to the last person and they repeat it, it's totally turned around and upside down. That's what happens with bad communication. And so Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, gives us the definition of sin. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. When the neurotransmitters are disrupted, when there's false neurotransmitters, you have deceptive communication between the neurons. And you'll remember in Spirit of Prophecy, Sister White says one of the main causes of battles in the church is because of people of what they've eaten at their table. It causes wrong thinking. They say no when they should say yes, and they say yes when they should say no. What is affected is the neurotransmitters. So there's three different kinds. There's excitatory, inhibitory, and modulatory. Now, some of the samples diseases that happen with neurotransmitters, poor neurotransmission, is depression. So depression is a problem with neurotransmitters, being too high, being too low, being disrupted. So um, acetylcholine is mostly an excitatory um, transmitter. It causes the nerve to fire. GABA is inhibitory. It causes the transmission of a signal to stop. Then you have serotonin and dopamine. Those both are inhibitory. 
um, but they're also modulatory. They affect other nerves and their function. So um, there's a whole lecture that I would love to do sometime on the difference between um, happiness and pleasure. So dopamine and serotonin are always in a contest. Dopamine will get into the serotonin receptors and our addictive nature, we always want to go for pleasure. But the more pleasure we seek, the less happiness we have. So it's kind of like a teeter-totter. Um, we can't have both. So we should not seek for pleasure, not the type of pleasure that God gives. God really gives happiness. It's the um, pleasure seekers, like jumping out of a, an airplane, skydiving for an adrenaline rush, that type of thrill seeking. And then I wanna mention glutamate and aspartate. Those are amino acids. Those are excitatory neurotransmitters. Here's an example of where if the neurotransmitter is tainted, that you will get static and even death of a neuron. So when you have glutamate, as you have it in your whole beings, as you have it in hundreds of plants, you know, it's, um, it's ubiquitous throughout the plant world. But when it's in the form that comes from nature, the way God put it into plants, it is in a shape, it's, it's called L form, like the letter L. And when man refines a food, like let's take soy, for example. So when soy is refined, it's put in a vat, and it's fermented. The fermentation process is actually, um, it's, you could say it's natural, but it's going to flip the glutamate molecule and put it in D, like in David, D form. And that is a neurotoxin, an excitotoxin. And when that stimulates the nerve cell, instead of a nice smooth transmission, it, over, it causes overfiring, causes the nerve to overreact, and it can even cause death of the neuron. So um, the problem with Alzheimer's and dementia is a problem with glutamate. It has um, gotten in probably in the D form in a large way, and has caused breaking down of the neurotransmitters. So anyway, there's over a hundred neurotransmitters. They all have a specific role in helping um, the brain to function, putting messages through the body, causing us to communicate within our brain and to function. So neurotransmitters are very important and very delicate. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. This is just kind of tells what some of the neurotransmitters do. Like I mentioned under the blue one there, glutamate, it's for memory and um, dopamine and serotonin for pleasure and mood. So let's move on. So then as you come down out of the brain to the spinal cord, that's called your central nervous system. And then you have nerves that go to every tissue of your body from the tips of your fingers to the tips of your toes. That's called the peripheral nervous system. And they all communicate throughout the body. And these, these neur neurons, the nerves, they're, they're divided into different groups. I'm not gonna get into that today but they stimulate all of your system, your muscles, your skin, the, the muscles that control the hair on your arms. It controls, um, they go to your heart, they go to your lung, to your stomach. And that's why if you get bad news in the middle of a meal, your stomach just tends to clamp down. You feel like you're gonna be sick. It's because of the effect of the nervous system on your digestive system. So the nervous system is intricately linked to every function of the body. 
Now I wanna go back up and talk about the frontal lobe function. And you know, it's probably 20 years ago, some of this information wasn't so well known, but um, many people are out there talking about it. And I, I, I'm just repeating it in case any of you haven't heard this before. And I wanna put it in a context as we're looking at the idea that Satan used his power of hypnosis. What is going on in the brain? How is that working? So when we look at the frontal lobe, we know that this part, the frontal lobe, that's what we call it, our forehead. And so this part, it's one third of the brain. It's the largest portion of your brain. It is the seat of judgment, of reason, and of intellect. And I just, I want to put on here, it's important to understand this. Intellect is very different than intelligence, but intellect is the ability to learn and to reason and to have a capacity for knowledge and understanding. <clears throat> it is related to facts and to laws. So when God created Adam and Eve, every day was going to be an education system. And God was teaching him his laws. The, the moral law, the health laws are, um, as we hear them, they're embedded in the frontal lobe. It's our center of spirituality, um, our desire to worship. It's related to morality. Morality is a little bit different than spirituality. Morality has to do with the ability to discern good and evil. And how you discern good and evil is going to depend on the um, facts and the information that you accept and that you store. If you, if you don't believe in God, your morality can be different than someone who is a Bible-believing Christian. And then most importantly, the frontal lobe is the home of the will, the decision-making part of the brain. Now I wanna move on to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is responsible for temperature control, for animal drives or survival instinct, such as preservation of self. And this is not only physical, but mental. So we all have opinions, we all think we're right or maybe most of the time we think we're right. So it's preservation of our opinions. And that's why we get offended when someone doesn't agree with us or there's, we're at odds with someone else's belief system. We are, our hypothalamus is going to stimulate this preservation of self. We have to protect what we believe are, is right in our own thinking. It's the center for hunger. And over in the picture, if you look to the far left, I've got a red circle there on this. The green part is the hypothalamus. That little tiny part of the hypothalamus is your hunger center. So very, very small, less than the tip of your finger is what drives you to eat. It's also the center for thirst, for mating, for protection, to build a shelter, freedom of movement, and avoidance of pain. Now, de deeply associated with the limbic system is this nucleus accumbens. And in the 1950s, two scientists had discovered this tissue, and they weren't sure what it was, but they thought that it was associated with pleasure. So they took a rat and they, um, in, they, they surgically implanted an electrode into the nucleus accumbens. And their hypothesis was that as they would give the rat an electrical current, because we think of that as being negative, they thought that the rat would have an avoidance of pain. And so as you see in the picture, there was a paddle 
and that was hooked up to an electric current. And as the rat would touch that paddle, it would get an electrical charge through the um, implant in its nucleus accumbens. And so what they saw happen, it took them a while to get used to the paddle and what would happen. And they would go over and they touch the paddle maybe once or twice in an hour, but they would get the stimulation. And quite the opposite happened than what the scientists expected. Pretty soon they began going to the paddle for more and more stimulation until they were so stimulated by it, they were going to the paddle over 700 times an hour to the point of physical exhaustion. They quit eating and quit drinking and all they were doing was going for the stimulation from this electrical current and they died of exhaustion. So this was the beginning of science, beginning to understand the role of the nucleus accumbens and particularly dopamine. So every time the um, electrode would fire into the nucleus accumbens and they would get this stimulation, they found that the neurotransmitter of dopamine was released. So dopamine was discovered to be the hormone of pleasure and the nucleus accumbens was nicknamed the pleasure center. So now let's pull this and put this all together. So we have the higher power of the brain, we have the lower power, the frontal lobe over the limbic system. So we have the seat of judgment, of reason and intellects, your inf information center, your spirituality, who and what you're going to worship, your sense of right and wrong, and most of all, the will, how you're going to make a decision. So I want to summarize that in the frontal lobe, it is the seat of the law, the government. And then in the limbic system, where you have your emotions, your affections, and all your um, survival drives, the pleasure center with the nucleus accumbens, uh, that is your area of desire. So we have desires under the law. So just to make it practical, um, as you look at, let's, let's look at hunger. And so you, as your blood sugar is dropping, your hypothalamus through a mechanism that can measure your blood glucose, particularly in the brain, the brain is going to pick that up and say, we need to eat because if my sugar drops, I won't be able to function. And so you get a signal that you're hungry. Now, if you were not living by the higher power, as soon as you feel hungry, you might just go and pick up um, whatever snack is laying around. You might grab a handful of, well, I'm just thinking raisins, or you might grab a donut, or you might, you know, some people might not even eat. They might grab a cup of coffee and that might um, turn their hunger away. But if you're living with the frontal lobe as your driver, as your higher power, and you have the laws of God in your mind, you're going to say, well, let me see what time it is. Is it time to eat? And then if it is time to eat or to get ready to eat, you're going to say, okay, what is the best food for my body? It's not just going to be that you're going to haphazardly grab whatever you can. You make a decision based on what is right, according to the laws of God. And so you see the higher powers, it is critical that you have stored the laws of God and that you know how to respond when your limbic system um, calls you. So here we have it in, in this picture, the higher power is to be above the lower powers. And it just happens anatomically that the frontal lobe is above the limbic system. So we want the laws of God over desires. And, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I wanna give you another example. 
And I don't know who all's watching. I assume almost everybody is um, an adult. But in today's society, we know that one of the ways that Satan is working to destroy man, just like he wanted to prevent the children of Israel from going into the promised land, right before they went in, Baal, Baal Peor happened. And he brought in the Midianite women and he created a pleasure um, center and got all the people involved in sexual, sensual pleasure into the, into, to the place where they gave way to the limbic system. So their passions and their natural God-given um, survival for mating was put in a context where their desires were above the laws of God and they had a great fall. And so it's, there's nothing wrong with the gift that God has given us to have a desire for a mate and in the appropriate time and place to have those relationships. But what Satan has done in our world today has um, been to create a, a situation where we take away the law, we say we don't need to be married, and we have free sexual relationships. So that's, an, that's another example where without the laws ruling the limbic system, we have sin. So as we go back and we look at this, we have um, the, the law over the desires. So remember that perspective. Now let's go to the um, to the um, to the throne room and let me ask you this question. We have a throne room, but who is the king that sets on the throne? So when you look at the function of the frontal lobe. We see that, you know, multiple things happen here. Who is it that is the king that sits on the throne? So that's our question. Who is the king? Now let's go back to our list. A king is the ruler. He has authority. He has power. He makes decisions. He makes laws. He gives orders. He enforces those orders. He's supreme. So when we look back at the function of the frontal lobe, we're going to see that the king is the will. So I want to introduce you to King Will. This is who should sit on the throne of your frontal lobe. And we're told that the will is the decision center, the spring of all actions forming an important factor in the character. Just because we know something is right does not give us the power to carry out that judgment. What we need is an electrical power. It is the will that is the governing power. So you can remember you hear of will power. So will power is not your will, but is it is the electrical current that is generated by your decision to do something. And we talk a little bit more about that in the physiology of victory. So we're told in volume, um, well, let me do ministry of healing first. The tempted one needs to understand the true force of the will. Everything depends on the right action of the will. Ministry of healing, page 176. And then in volume five of the testimonies, page 515, we see that our will is the spring of all our actions. This will forms so important a factor in the character of man. So as we are looking for the soon coming of Jesus, we know that only those who have a character that reflects the character of Jesus are going to be allowed into the kingdom of heaven. So understanding the will is important to understand because that forms a factor 
in development of our character. And I want to recommend that everybody look at um, volume two of Mind, Character, and Personality, um, chapter 76, where it talks about the decision and the will. So it's not just what the will does. The will has to have input. And just like our government, just like in business, in any other association, all leaders have advisors. So what are the advisors of the will? So I just have a list here. Um, I think it's important that all of you think about this because this is going to help you understand um, what undermines your will. You know, I think most of us have so much information, but we don't do everything we know we should do because we fail in exercising our will. So first of all on the list, our senses. Our five senses are seeing, our smell, our taste, our hearing, and our touch. All of those are critical to the, um, the action of the will. In fact, like I mentioned, neuroeconomics, you think of places like Las Vegas, I'm going to tell you, in places like that, what they are going to accentuate are your senses um, because they want is more that they stimulate the senses. It's going to break down the will and people give their mortgage to their house away. There are so many broken lives because of what happens at um, the Las Vegas places. And so here we see an undermining of the will through the senses. And then our emotions, our feelings. This is a huge trap. We, we become overwhelmed by our emotions, by our feelings, our experiences. They have a great effect. In fact, I think this is one of the ways that God works with us more than anything. He allows us to make mistakes. He allows us to experience pain because in that experience, it tends to teach us more than if we just listen to somebody and say, I wouldn't do that if I was you. But if you do it and you experience the downfall of it, the pain of it, you're going to learn much deeper than if you just read something in a book, unfortunately. Then our peers, you hear about peer pressure, um, um, what other people think being humiliated by them, you know, mocking you. That has a great influence on, on our decisions. Our knowledge base, that's why we are to grow in knowledge. As you look at Peter's ladder, you know, he says, add to your knowledge temperance. So when we learn more about the health message, you learn, oh, this food isn't good. Oh, this practice isn't good. It's, it plants in our mind a standard for our will to have a basis when we say, I want to do what is right. And then our habits, our habits can be good and our habits can be bad. Unfortunately, it's easier to make bad habits than it is to break them. Our environment plays a huge um, role on our decisions. That's why we're told to live in the country where we're near to God and we're not in that stimulating um, atmosphere of city life. And then, of course, we have God and his angels, and we have satanic um, angels and Satan himself putting a pressure on us. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm just about where I should be stop, um, stopping. Let me, let me go through just a little bit more. I want to um, get to this place. We haven't developed the idea of hypnosis, but we're almost there. So I'm going to go kind of fast so that I can get to the um, explanation of hypnosis. So it's very important to understand our human mind. There is nothing like the human mind. Scientists all the time, especially those who believe in evolution, they're trying, they're trying to discover why is the human brain so much different than all of other created um, animals? You know, why are we so different even than primates, um, our dogs, our rats? You know, it's our, in, our ability for intellectual development, our ability for reasoning power, 
for vision, for imagination, for creativity. It is our drive for worship and our freedom of choice. These all come into play. And so when we look at the value of our mind, I just, I, I just want to bring this up. This, this is several years old, and I didn't take the time to look at the most expensive car in the world. But a number of years ago, when I put this together, one of the most expensive cars in the world was a Veyron Bugatti. Um, oh, this was a Lamborghini. So I looked up this one. So sometimes it was a Ve Veyron Bugatti, but this is a Lamborghini. It has 750 horsepower. It goes from zero to 60 miles per hour in 2.6 seconds. The top speed is 221 miles per hour. I don't remember how much fuel it goes through in about five minutes, but it's humongous. But this car back oh, is like in 2013, I think it was that I looked this up. It was four and a half million dollars. So, you know, I look at this and I think, boy, if I was going to pay that much for a car, I'd want it to be like a spacecraft and be able to ride to heaven. You know, there's no way I, a car like that expense is, is not for me. But I want to bring that out because I want to compare it to our brain. We are the most expensive vehicle in the universe. And why do I say that? Because in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, we're told that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ. There, we are more valuable than unfallen angels because unfallen angels were not bought with the blood of Jesus. And so, you know, if this doesn't touch our heart, nothing will. God values us so much and will do anything to save us and to get us back home. But back to the Lamborghini, if someone is going to pay that much money for it, they are going to most likely take care of this car. They're going to do the maintenance. They're going to put the right fuel in it and the right oil. They're going to put the fluids in, keep the air pressure right. They're going to keep it polished. They probably have a, a house that is, you know, more expensive than the car that they keep it in. You know, they have pride in this vehicle and every vehicle comes with an owner manual and we have an owner manual. So as we study the scripture, we need to understand what God wants for us to take care of this body that he has given us. So I want to move through and just compare the temples of God. So um, why does God care about our health? He tells us in the sanctuary. So on earth, we had Moses' temple, we had Solomon's, and we had Herod's. How were they made? They were patterned after the heavenly. And when they were completed, they were filled with the Shekinah glory. Well, not Herod's. You know, it was lost after Solomon's. But in Moses' tabernacle, we were filled, the, the most holy place was filled with the Shekinah glory, God's presence. That was his throne room. And so those, that, those temples were um, started in, in the time of the children of Israel. But the original temple of God was in the garden. It was Adam. It was patterned after the heavenly Genesis 1:27. Let us make man in our image. And then when God had formed man, he breathed into him the breath of life and man became a living soul. We're filled with God's spirit. We wore a robe of white symbolizing the presence of God. And then we're told, of course, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, and don't let anyone undermine the power of this passage, that we are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in us. If any man defile this temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Okay, so we know 
that it is God's purpose that we are the original temple that he wants to abide in. And so in the garden, Adam and Eve were made to be the temple. And after Christ's um, life and death and resurrection, again, we could be filled with the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you this question. Where is God's throne room in this temple? As we look at the earthly sanctuaries and we have the courtyard, the holy place and the most holy, we see, I'm, I'm gonna skip the courtyard and the holy place for time. Um, most of us know this and anyone who doesn't, you can email me or ask um, even Brother Andrew, he can explain this. But in the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant, and within the Ark was the law of God. So let's compare the sanctuary most holy place to the frontal lobe. The sanctuary most holy place was the place of judgment, of justification, the presence of God. It was the place of atonement. It was where decisions were made through the Urim and the Thummim and the covering angels. When a question arose, the high priest or even our, would go in or the priest that was wearing the high priest garments and they would ask the Lord what direction. And it was through the Urim and the, the covering angels. You compare that right over to the frontal lobe, the place of judgment, the place of reason, of intellect, um, of spirituality, morality, and the will. And I, I left off on here. Let's see if I've got it. Oh, here we go. So the big thing that overlaps in the sanctuary, in the, the Ark of the Covenant, was the law of God. And in our frontal lobe, it's where God places his laws. So I believe that the frontal lobe is the most holy place. It is the place where God um, designs that our personality and our character that should reflect him is being developed. Um, I'm going to skip the story of Phineas Gage. In Revelation 14 and Revelation 13, we're told that God's people will have the Father's name written in their forehead. The Father's name is his character which is impressed in their frontal lobe. And the mark or the name of the beast of the satanic powers is in their forehead. So we are either going to have the character of God or we are going to have the character of his arch enemy of Satan. So we are not left in darkness. The strategy in this contest was told to us by Jesus in Matthew 12, 29. Jesus said, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, then he will spoil his house. So what Jesus is saying, how is the human being going to be taken over? The one who is attacking must bind the strong man. So who is this strong man that you have to bind? It is the will. We are told the will is the governing power. So how do you capture the will? Let's look at this chart. This is a chart. It's not anatomically correct, but it is functionally correct. So in the outer dark pink circle, we have the conscious mind. And in the inner circle, the light pink, we have the unconscious mind. And so let's start from the unconscious mind or the subconscious. That is where habits and patterns are laid down. It's automatic body functions, cellular memory, creativity, emotions, and protection. And then as we move to the conscious mind, that's where planning is done. The will is there. Critical thinking, short-term memory, judgments, decisions, and long-term memories. So from what we have just discussed, we will see that the conscious mind 
is directly talking about the frontal lobe and the subconscious is talking about the limbic system. So let me, before we go right into talking about hypnosis, you need to learn, know a few things about the subconscious mind. First of all, it does not judge what you tell it. It only takes all information as fact. You can tell just from that sentence right there, that can be dangerous. If everything that you're told you take as a fact, that's trouble. So, you know, that's the, one of the downsides of media, of watching the news. It is rampant in our world. Our world is full of propaganda, but people are believing it. Why? Because they're using their subconscious mind. They do not have their conscious mind filled with the truths of God's word. So next, the subconscious mind cannot tell the difference between true and false. It works 24 hours a day when you're sleeping, when you're daydreaming, when you're eating, whatever, whenever, whatever you're doing, the subconscious is working. It takes everything as literal. It never says no. Remember that. That's probably one of the key parts of the subconscious mind. It only recognizes the present time. If you're hungry and something's offered to you, it doesn't think about long term. It just thinks about satisfying itself right now. It's the source of night dreams and automatic thought. It's the repository for every thought, every vision, every emotion, every incident that has ever occurred in your life is stored in the subconscious mind. During a surgery, the surgeon touched part of the brain and a woman heard a um, symphony that she heard, had heard years ago, note for note, she heard it perfectly. It was all stored in her subconscious mind. So here we go. And we're still gonna have time for questions and answers. So how do you capture the will? It is through hypnosis. So let's understand hypnosis. All hypnosis is self-hypnosis. The client has complete control over their experience. Hypnosis is an awake state where the body, the physical body is relaxed. The conscious mind, which is what? It's the frontal lobe. So the frontal lobe is subdued. What's in the frontal lobe? The standard of God, the law of God, the laws of life are in the conscious mind. So the laws of God, what is right is subdued. The subconscious mind that never says no, that can't judge true from false is heightened and becomes open to suggestion. Then the, the hypnotherapist will give suggestions that are accepted as true and affect the beliefs, the habits, the perceptions, and the behaviors of the individual. Right there, you can see how dangerous this is. So what exactly does hypnosis do? This is right from a hypnotherapist website page. Hypnosis is a tool that is used to rid us of the inhibitions or behaviors that may be holding us back in life. They also said on this page that things like Judeo-Christian beliefs, they're old fashioned and they create inhibitions in us that are holding us back and we have to get rid of those beliefs. So hypnosis is a tool to free us from all those legalistic laws that we have as Christians. A hypnotherapist cannot make us do or say anything outside our belief system or without our participation and agreement. 
I never used to think that was true because I thought you just became, came under this power and then whatever the hypnotherapist told you is what you did. But it's not that. You have to choose to take those suggestions. So, you know, if a hypnotherapist tells you that you're going to walk like a duck and quack like a duck, and you do that up on stage, it's not that that's so unusual for you. You're probably somebody that you go around and you act like a clown anyway, you know, so you have fun doing that and your, your, your mind is open to doing what the hypnotherapist is telling you. So I want to bring this over to the question. Can Satan force us to sin? Let me read from Desire of Ages, page 125. The tempter can never compel us to do evil. He cannot control minds unless they are yielded to his control. The will must consent. Faith must let go its hold upon Christ before Satan can exercise his power upon us. So let's summarize. Here is what hypnosis does. So here's the way God made our brain. Here's the way he makes the universe. You have the higher powers over the lower powers. So you have the frontal lobe. You have the laws of God that rule the desires that come from the limbic system. So remember, God's order of authority is the higher power over the lower power. Satan's plan is the lower power becomes the higher power. And so then you have the lower power ruling what really is um, the, the higher power. I hope I didn't say that to confuse you. Basically, he swip, swip, switches it. So what hypnosis does is he takes the higher powers of the frontal lobe and the lower powers of desire and he flips it. How do they do this? It's by focused attention, physical relaxation, diminished peripheral awareness. It's like sitting in a comfortable chair watching television. You have focused attention, you're relaxed, and you have these um, constant little blurps of of pictures sent that go into the brain. By repetition, rapid change of scenes, heightened suggestibilities and fantasies. So it flips it where the limbic system, the lower power becomes the higher power and it rules over the laws of God. It is wiped out. So how do you do this? By bypassing the conscious mind. And if you wanna study Look up some of the words in the spirit of prophecy, anything that beclouds the mind, anything that distracts the mind, anything that numbs the mind. You know, we think of alcohol. Alcohol numbs the mind. Listening to rock music or contemporary Christian music clouds the mind. Um, being too busy, there's, there's many different ways of distracting the mind, but I'm gonna move on. The difference between prayer and meditation, it totally changes the brainwave. Prayer in the form of godly prayer, biblical prayer versus new age meditation. Prayer is using the frontal lobe. It's a direct open communication with God. New age type meditation, spiritual formation. This is where you, you self-hypnotize and you are working from the limbic system, you're looking for an emotional experience. And I'll just go over this quick and then we'll stop. So I wanna talk about amusement. You know, there's a million ways in this world that people seek amusement. And I want to tell you, it's not so funny. It will lead in our destruction. So what is amusement? So if you take the word and you split it into its parts, a muse. Muse means to think and a means without. So just like a theist is someone who believes in God, who follows God, and a 
atheist is someone who doesn't believe in God. So amusement is to cause to not think. So all these things that we do, sports, partying, um, you know, all these entertainment type things to amuse ourselves is to put us into a satanic hypnotic trance. So I'm going to have to stop here and we'll take some questions. I wasn't able to show you from Genesis 3 what Satan did, but maybe we can do that, pick that up another time. So Brother Andrew, if we can maybe look yes, at thank some you. questions. Thank you, Diane. Appreciate your sharing that with us. I do have a question here from uh, that Fran posted. If you don't know what's in your subconscious, how do you know what you will and what you won't do? That's an excellent question. So if you remember what I said about the subconscious, back here, the very last thing, it is a repository for every thought, every visual, every emotion, every incidence that has ever occurred in your life. That is why the statement in Spirit of Prophecy says, guard well the senses, for they are the avenue to the soul. Um, everything that you have been exposed to in life is implanted in your subconscious. You're not going to remember it all. When you're driving down the freeway, and it, we don't see it so much as we used to, but there's billboards, and you only see it in the flash second, but your subconscious picks it up. Um, you remember the term subliminal advertisement. So on, on television, when, when there's a commercial, they can insert little screens, you know, frames that say, by tide, by tide. You know, your, your conscious mind is not picking that up, but your subconscious is. And then when you go to the grocery store and you're going down the aisle to get laundry soap, and there's hundreds of choices. What are you gonna choose? You don't know why this happens, but you, you look around and you say, hmm, I think I'll try Tide, and you pick up the Tide. You have no idea why you did that. So my recommendations is you've got to guard your senses. I bring, um, I have an Android that I don't use for a phone, but I have the Spirit of Prophecy on it. And I love the new app because you can listen to the Spirit of Prophecy audio. And I bring headphones. And sometimes I forget them and I'm always sorry. Part of the satanic takeover of the New World Order is to pipe um, rock and roll music, satanic music, everywhere you go. It's at the gas station when you're pumping gas. It's in Goodwill. It's in grocery stores. It's everywhere you go. And those messages are going into your brain. I used to purposely, um, willfully listen to bad music. And now that I know better, you know, if I walk into a store and a song comes on, that I love from before, it takes me days to get it out of my mind. So that's why I try to bring earphones and put it on and listen to the Bible or something that blocks out that message. So all I can say is one, there's things that have gone into our mind from the time we were born. When you're a little baby, you think about it. You don't remember what happened to you from, from in utero to when you're a year old, a month old, two years old, but those are forming thoughts and feelings. And many of us, as we grow up in adulthood, there's things that the way that we react and we don't know why, but we're not without help and without hope. So I, I don't believe in this um, therapy where you, um, go back to your birth, you know, and your painful traumatic, you know, um, experience in the birth canal, you know, where they, I forget what they call it, 
but I don't believe in having to do that. I believe that God will heal the broken heart. And we might not understand all the bad things that have gone into our brain and into our body, but by putting in the right things, it will overwrite those bad um, memories and those bad habits that were put in. So you do the best you can, you ask forgiveness. I know when I was coming out of the world and I gave my life back to the Lord, it took a long time before I wouldn't have bad dreams and dreams that I shouldn't have. And finally, I just realized before I go to bed, it's like I would pray for the helmet of salvation to be upon me even while I, while I sleep. I pray that God will give me heavenly thoughts while I sleep. You are in a subconscious state when you're sleeping. So God, God can protect you, but you have to ask him. Kind of a follow-up question, which you started on there, Dr. Diane, was where do dreams come from? And can they come from Satan? Absolutely. The, so your dreams, um, just like um, we're talking about this subconscious, everything that's happening to you, even your conscious mind, th there's less than 10% of what happens to us in our day that we are aware of. But um, as you go to sleep, the brain is doing its filing and everything that, let's say you're in school and you're reading things and you're trying to um, get down some information. It's when you sleep that the brain puts that into longer term memory. And so things that have stimulated you through the day, your food will affect you. So if you eat late before you go to bed, um, it's going to create a, an alcoholic system and um, in your body and your stomach is not going to be able to sleep. That will impact our dreams. And absolutely, yes, Satan can um, influence your dreams. So that's why I think it's so important at all times that we ask for God's protection, but particularly when we go to sleep because we're very vulnerable. So we just ask God to keep our minds, and I know he will. But you've got to cooperate. You don't go watching um, movies and, and programs that are not godly. You know, the Bible says, I will set no evil thing before me. And so we are responsible for everything we choose to listen to and choose to watch. So you've got to cooperate with God. brings to mind whatsoever things are pure, lovely, et cetera, think on these things. Yes, yes. And that's why, you know, that makes me think of Sister White says that we need to carry a small Bible with us. And every time we have a, a, a moment, start memorizing a scripture, start reading a passage so that we're constantly bathing our brain with heavenly atmosphere and heavenly thoughts. And pretty soon it will become second nature. It's interesting to note that uh, research has verified the fact that harp music is the most beneficial music to human uh, physiology. Yes, it's the most calming, definitely. Yes, so music is another avenue um, for influencing our brain. It's probably one of the most powerful, and it's one of the things that Satan understands the most because that was his position in heaven. So music is very critical um, in understanding. I am not a, a big in understanding music, but I've listened to Christian Berdahl and a number of other presentations, you know, the music that has crept into our worship service, hypnotic, repetitive, um, and some of these that are also almost like lullabies, you know, that is putting our frontal lobe to sleep, you know, so we need very active frontal lobe type mess, um, music and messages. Absolutely. Uh, if there's other questions, you can type them in the chat box. Um, 
just uh, also thinking about the music that is sung in our churches, uh, if you look at the basis for which some of those um, come from, uh, the music and the lyrics is not from sources uh, that are ordained by God. And yet to play those in our churches, we have to have a license that uh, actually funds those entities that produces that music. So it's, uh, it behooves us to pay attention to the songs that, that we allow ourselves to be subjected to, whether they're from heaven um, or whether they're from um, alternative sources. That's right. That's right. Um, I want to mention something. I know I'm, we're going to be running out of time. I want to bring us back to the scripture in Revelation 3. I think it was verse 21. And to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am, and am sat down set down with my father in his throne. So let me ask you, after talking about the throne room, if we were patterned after the divine image and our frontal lobe, the frontal lobe of this temple is, I mean, our most holy place is the frontal lobe. The throne room is the frontal lobe. What is Jesus's throne room? Any thoughts? Friend says the mind. No, it's something specific. The mind can be the cerebellum, the brainstem, the parietal lobe. What specific? What the specific? Frontal lobe. The frontal lobe. That is the throne room. And so in the frontal lobe is the character of God. And remember in Philippians 2, 5, it says, hi, Paul and Marita. <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, Paul is saying in Philippians, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. And so what, what Jesus is saying is, we must regain the character of God, that divine image. So to him that overcomes, will I grant to sit with me in my throne? You're going to have my mind. Your mind and my mind are going to be in harmony, even as I overcame. How did Jesus overcome? He overcame by the word of his testimony, by quoting scripture, by resisting the power of Satan. And so because he gained that victory, he sat down in the Father's throne. Jesus' mind, when he was combined, his mind in divinity was exactly like the Father's. But then he came and he took on humanity. And now he had to form in humanity back to the divine image. And so what he is saying to us in, in the Laodicean message, as you overcame, as I overcame, you're going to have my mind like I had the mind of the father, my frontal lobe, my character. Exactly. Do you see, can you see that scripture differently now? Yes. So that's, that's demonstrating the submission of the will to God by submitting our will to the God to God, um, we take on His His will. Absolutely, um, not my will be done, but Thy will be done. All of Jesus's hypothalamus, all of His survival um, instincts in Him, did not want to go through the crucifixion. Did not want to carry the the burden of sin did not want to be separated from the father. In fact, it was so powerful. Remember in Desire of Ages, it said that he like held on to the ground as though to stop being pulled into it. He sweat blood. He was under so much pressure. His human nature resisted what he was going through. Father, you can do anything. Take this cup from me. 
nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will. And sure. we, we will never be called to undergo as much as what Jesus went through, through for us, but we are going to have more than we can bear without the strengthening of God to help us through what's coming ahead. So, so I think you, I think you're kind of speaking to it right now, but uh, someone's asking, how can you submit your will to God? You've kind of just told Jesus experience. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, part of this whole process, I mean, um, this question, how do you submit your will to God? Um, it's our battle. It's the battle of the flesh against the spirit. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so I like those. Um, we're told very specific in the spirit of prophecy, how to pray in steps to Christ and Christ object lessons. Um, the chapter on the two worshipers, we're to say, because of pride in our heart, we come to God and we say, take me Lord, for I am thine. I cannot give myself because of pride. I cannot even humble myself, but Lord, I'm choosing for your will to be done. You promise in Philippians 2.13 that it is God who works in me both to will and to do his good pleasure. And so it's like, Lord, everything in me right now is resistant. I do not feel like being spiritual. I do not feel like being right, but I don't want to feel this way. I want your will to be done. Please grant me your Holy Spirit. Please change my thinking. You know, all those promises that you read in the Bible and spirit of prophecy, like in 2 Corinthians, um, is it chapter 4? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness and bringing every thought into captivity to Jesus. You go to him, Lord, my thoughts, I, I mean, when we're under temptation, the powers of darkness are pressing on us. And there's many times that we don't want to do what's right. I, I'll tell you when you're angry, when someone's made you angry, when you, now nah, there's just so many emotions. I have had so many times it's like, I do not want to, to let go of this anger, but I just kneel before God and say, please, I cannot get up until you change me. I do more of this physiology in, in physiology of victory. So, so Diane, <laughs> someone's asking uh, specifically here about the blood brain barrier and asking about uh, if there is a way to stop COVID from entering uh, the brain via the blood brain barrier. Um, I'm going to say yes. Um, and Mercy and Joyce have put out a number of things. Um, there's a number of protocols. I know that dandelion leaf blocks the spike protein, chlorophyll, um, so green leafy plants. I like, I, I use chlorella in spirulina because they're very high. They're probably one of the highest sources of whole food chlorella. That will block it. Um, Pine needle bark blocks it. Um, St. John's wort. There's a whole list of natural herbs and foods that will block the spike protein and the graphene oxide, some of these toxins. So um, I, I tell you, I underestimated COVID. I didn't realize the, the technology behind it. It is not fighting a typical influenza. It is a bioweapon and you must have an armory um, to, to protect yourself. So um, get some of these things. I can put my email in here. Someone put a list. Oh, Andrew, you did. Um, I have a list that I got from the internet by David Wolf. And, you know, you talk about NAC, anacetylcholine, um, um, quercetin, those type of things. But what I like about Mercy and Joyce's program is they go for the whole food. Anacetylcysteine, I said choline, anacetylcysteine has um, been found that it can cause lung cancer. So I don't want to use 
an isolated substance. Um, maybe when you're real critical, you need a high concentration just for a short period. But we are going to want to be getting our bodies just inundated with some of the things from nature that God gives us to protect us. Thank you very much. Oh, um, one of the other things, um, and this was on Med Missionary, oh, a couple months ago. Randy, was that his name? He's, a, he's not a certified herbalist, but he studied herbs and he's done a lot of extensive research for COVID. And he mentions black cumin seed. seed. So I, I have the whole seed, not the oil. It's very potent, but that will block the spike protein that stops the inflammation, that stops the thrombolytic um, process of the spike protein. So black cumin seed is a very powerful thing. My son just had COVID and I just brought the black, I browned the seed and brought it over to him with the raw honey. And in two doses, he turned the corner. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Is there so, a whole food source of NAC? Um, yes. So um, that's what I put my email out there, simplypurematters at gmail.com. If you'll email me and ask me for the protocol for COVID, I'll send it to you because I, there's dozens of foods that are high in quercetin. Your citrus is a, a very good source. You want to use the, the rind as well as the juice. So lemons and grapefruit, those are very high in quercetin. Um, onions and garlic. And that's a big thing with um, Joyce and Mercy. That's why the onion and garlic is so powerful. Um, I'll mention to Alamed. Alamed is the garlic concentrate. 10 drops of Alamed liquid um, allicin from the garlic has over 2,000 cloves of, of garlic. 10 drops. It's powerful. So... If you want some of that, you'd have to, you can get it from Walt Cross, um, the mustard seed in Tennessee. Um, I do carry it. I don't have it on hand. I have to order it, but um, I can get it as well. But Walt Cross at the mustard seed is a good source. I see a question, and do you need to mix the black cumin seed with honey? Um, I know you don't have to, but it makes it go down a lot easier. I'm not quite sure if the honey um, makes it more potent, but I don't use honey. I'm very sensitive to sugars, um, but it is strong. And I eat it with the meal because it'll tend to upset your stomach. So I just, I use a little bit of it, but I think that's one of the purposes of the honey is helping the medicine go down. Ginger, somebody mentioned ginger. Ginger is very good. Charcoal, charcoal will also help. Um, I see, doesn't the black seed have to be heated also? I don't know about that. Um, I haven't heard that it needs to be. So, so somebody posted the link for the, the book from, uh, from Randall. Okay. In, in the chat area. Thank you. And, Monica uh, did that. Just repent, reposted the, your email address for folks. Okay. And, um, you know, I was looking up the black cumin seed and something that I found interesting, the potent ingredient in black cumin seed is where is um, um, what is it that we use for malaria? Quinine. It's a natural source of quinine. And so when I um, saw that, you know, it's like, oh, we're not supposed to use quinine. But then I realized it's not the quinine substance itself that is bad. 
the medicine quinine that was used in um, Ellen White's day had mercury in it. So it was the mercury that was objectionable, not the quinine. So black cumin seed has that natural um, medicinal effect of quinine. If anybody finds anything out there about quinine otherwise, let me know. I've been looking and I don't see that quinine of itself as a natural substance in food is harmful. Well, I think that's the key there, Diane, is it's in a whole food form rather than isolated form. Right. And uh, the preparation may, I don't know, it sounds like it had mercury associated with it uh, mm -hmm. in its uh, extracted and refined form. Um, uh, one thing about the dandelion leaf you were mentioning earlier, I just saw a review of a new Pfizer drug that's supposed to be an antiviral in combination with uh, a, an older drug that they have that's no longer, it's off patent now, but it's a quite expensive drug. And it's basically its mechanism of action is to gum up or block the molecular docking site of the ACE2 receptor, uh, which is all over the body. And that's the target tissue of the spike protein, as well as blocking up the, the spike protein. It turns out that ivermectin has the exact same uh, uh, molecular docking blocking action at a fraction of the price. And as I saw that presentation, it dawned on me that the mechanism of action for dandelion leaf tea is exactly the same. It, it exactly. uh, blocks the molecular docking site of the ACE2 receptor, which you can get in your backyard. And, and that reminds me too, so Artemisia wormwood um, is effective, neem, Neem, which is used, all these things are antiparasitic. So it's rather interesting that antiparasitics are being affected. So those are a couple more things that Somebody are- Somebody is asking or noting that uh, with the um, well-known efficacy of NAC or NAC, being able to um, ward off uh, COVID infections that the FDA decided to ban its sale as, as a supplement. Is that anybody know um, any additional information about that? I have not heard that. I haven't heard it. I wouldn't be surprised, um, you know, because anything that they're finding is, is effective. I'm not, I, I'm not for using ivermectin. Um, it's effective. And as far as a drug goes, it has one of the least side effect profiles, um, but I still, it's a drug, it's a semi-synthetic, so it's part natural and part man-made, and they all have side effect. And so I always want to go to God's remedies that leave no residual effect. So I'm not going to criticize if somebody is going to choose that direction. Um, if they're not into using natural remedies and they don't, they don't have that mindset, it's, it's going to definitely be a drug of choice, if you ask me. And they're, I'm bringing it up because they're banning it because it's effective. So it's just part of the, the war out there. But I think God has superior ways of natural remedies. Well, and he's produced or, produced or provided for us, dandelion, which yes, is freely right. available um, across the world for the most part lots of different uh, species of dandelion and uh, just a very beneficial natural remedy and usage for much more than just this particular situation. It's just, yes. it's just a general tonic. Yes. So, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's going to have more questions. We're going to have to wind up, but I, I want to come back in a big part of, so I, I gave um, foundational presentation of what is hypnosis, but there's so much that is going to put you into the state of where the limbic system is ruling the frontal lobe. And one of the biggest ways is through our diet. And so when you look through the spirit of prophecy and, and you see everything that we put in our body is going to have a profound effect on our brain. Even sugar, you know, sugar kills the frontal lobe. It stimulates 
the limbic system. You know, there's the profile of the brain on sugar is parallel to cocaine and heroin, you know? So we would look down upon someone addicted to cocaine or heroin and say, oh, that's bad. But we don't realize that sugar is having a profound effect, not only on our body, but on our brain. So um, Sister Joyce has brought out this quote many times. I don't remember where it is, but you know, the gist of it is, as we get close to the end of time, we are going to change our diet to the simplest form, you know, simpler than ever in history. And part of that's going to be because we're not going to the grocery store. So, but it's time to be simplifying our diet, get things as natural and unstimulating as possible. We want to avoid things that are artificial, that do not come just from nature. So they can be things that originally come from nature, like I mentioned, soy, you know, but when it's fermented, it flips and it makes an excitotoxin that destroys the nerve cells. And so, you know, you take sugar, it comes from a natural source, but it leaches the body of essential nutrients, vital nutrients, and causes imbalance in our system. So it breaks down our physical body as well as our brain. So we want to learn to eat simple, whole plant food. We want to follow the doctors that God has given us. And, you know, whether it be how we sleep, how we eat, how we exercise, you know, our routine, our prayer life, our faith, this is a critical time in history. We are at the close of probation. We have the final message to give to the world. And so God is calling us to have clear minds he does not want us to be taken by the deceptions of Satan. And so the only way we can do this is by true fast, you know, following the principles that God has given us and by um, pleading for the spirit of prayer, that our prayer life and our connection to God to have the power from heaven is with us moment by moment. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Diane. Um, let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer and uh, just yes. thankful for the information that you've been able to bring and the, the questions that have been asked. Uh, let's bow our heads together. Lord, thank you so much for just the, the information that you've provided for us uh, in nature and, and today with uh, Dr. Diane sharing with us the, the functioning of the brain and the way that Satan can access us through the various avenues of the soul. And Lord, just we want to guard our hearts and our minds in particular, uh, that we may keep them in, in, in top shapes so that we can recognize the snares of the, of the evil one and just hide in our hearts the, the words of scripture that can guard our hearts and our minds, um, the full armor of God. Um, Lord, just uh, send your Holy Spirit to be with each person and family that's represented here and just ask a special hedge of protection around each family and those represented here uh, that they may guard their lives uh, from the attacks of the evil one and prepare them uh, for your soon coming in jesus name amen amen thank you very much yes thank you all for joining today thank you dr diane God thank bless. you marita Have a blessed week, everybody. Thank you. Yes, God bless you all. Thank you, Dr. Diane. Thank you, Thank you Edna. I think that was you, Amanda. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless. God Thank you, Dr. Diane. Dr. Diane, Dr. You, Diane how, can, how can we be in touch with you or connected to you? So I put my email up. Did you get it? Um, where? I just put it in the last chat. Oh, okay. So I have to get it right you away mean, before you, you guys close. Yes. Okay. Sim simply Pure Matters. Oh, simple? Simply. Pure. 
or simply pure matters. Okay. Yes. Yes. And if you don't hear back from me, write again. I, I get kind of inundated with things okay. and I might, I might miss them. So just keep working on getting through to me. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank God you bless all of you. you. Thank Happy you. Father. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Good night, everybody. God bless Good you. Good night, Diane. Week. Oh, hi, Elaine. Hi. <laughs> I'll call you soon. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Blessings on all of you this week. Thank you, Brother Andrew. You're welcome. Very, very good. Thank you. All right. I look forward to seeing everybody again for follow up. The next message. So next sure. week. Thank yes. you. Part two. Next week. Thank you. I don't know. Thank Is you. it next week? You Am know, I, I don't know, Diane. I'm not oh. really sure. <laughs> Whenever Joyce tells us, we'll do yeah, that's it. That's right. So I don't okay. know what next week is. Yeah. All right. Bye bye, everybody. I'm signing bye -bye. off. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Blessings. Bye. Thank you.